Welcome to Grace Life Church. I'm David Kinneberg, one of the teaching elders here at Grace Life. We want to thank you for joining us online and listening to our sermons online. Hope they are a blessing and encouragement to you. If you want more information, you can check out our website at glcanoka.org. Thanks and God bless. Um, today, as we're gathered here on this third Sunday of Advent, we're going to be examining a familiar passage from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. So I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Luke 1, 26 through 38. Before we delve into it, let's, let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, your word is a source of comfort and hope. As we're reminded of the prophet Jeremiah, he is mentioned in fifth, chapter 15 of his book, amidst severe persecution and trial. He said, your words were found and I ate them. Your words became a delight to me and the joy of my heart. Thank you, God, for your written word and your son, Jesus Christ, the living word. And I pray that we, like Jeremiah, would consume your word today so that it would become for us a joy and the delight of our hearts. May we trust in its precepts and promises, no matter what difficulties and dangers we may experience as believers in Christ. Lord, help us to respond to you today by holding fast that which is good and doing only those things that are pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. From our previous studies, if you recall in the early chapters of Genesis, we saw that way back in the dawn of time when man violated a sacred trust and fell into sin. We're told in Genesis 3, verses 6 and 7, that when the woman, namely Eve, saw that the tree produced fruit that was good for food and attractive to the eye and was desirable for making one wise, she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some of it to her husband, namely Adam, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And also, we're told in Romans 5.12, through the pen of the Apostle Paul, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, namely Adam, and death through sin, in this way death spread to all men, because all sinned. And shortly after man's fall into sin, God promised that one day there would be one who would come who would, in a sense, balance the scales, defeat evil, and deliver humanity. We're told in Genesis 3.15 that the Lord God said to the serpent, whom Satan had disguised himself as, I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. In this passage, it's known theologically as the Proto-Evangelium. It gives the first hint of the gospel. Satan would deliver a crippling blow to the seed or offspring of the woman, who namely is Jesus, who in turn would deliver a fatal blow to the serpent, first defeating him through his death and resurrection, as we're told in 1 Corinthians 15, and then destroying him in the final judgment, we're told of in Revelation chapter 12 and chapter 20. And for thousands of years, men waited. And while men we waited, God worked. God worked, first of all, by choosing Adam or Abraham from Ur of the Chaldees. We're told in Genesis 15, 7, that the Lord said to Abraham, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. And it was through this man, Abraham, that God raised up a nation known as Israel, which we're all very familiar with in the news these days, God worked through this nation to establish his law and his worship in the earth. And yet the people of Israel were constantly turning away from the Lord who had called them. We're told in 2 Chronicles 36, beginning with verse 15, that the Lord God of their ancestors continually warned them through his messengers, for he felt compassion for his people and his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messengers despised his warnings, and ridiculed his prophets. Finally, the Lord got very angry at his people, and there was no one who could prevent 
his judgment. But God, being the God he is, was patient with them. And he continued to work in spite of their tendency to follow false gods. He worked in spite of them turning a deaf ear to his word and to the preachers and prophets that he had sent to lead them. He worked in spite of the fact that they really didn't seem to care about him at all. God worked because he was completing a plan that began before the world was ever created. He worked because he was determined to send a, redeem, a redeemer, namely Jesus Christ, to this world to save the lost. He worked because he was motivated by a heart of love to see his people saved. So he worked in spite of everything they did, and in working, his love for them overcame every obstacle they placed in his path. Well, God kept on because he had promised to send a lamb into the world to die for sin. And today we're going to consider that part of God's work through, uh, that brought his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into this world. You know, of all the obstacles God faced in completing his plan to save sinners, the most challenging, at least from a human perspective, was getting his lamb into this world. In Isaiah 53, we're shown how God promised his lamb. In Isaiah 53, verses 6 and 7, we read, All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep silent before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. Well, this text interestingly, was written 700 years before the birth of Jesus. And we can rightly rule out Jesus as having done anything prior to his birth that the prophet could have recorded using the past tense. So the question is, why is Isaiah 53 written in the past tense as if Jesus' life and death had already happened? Why is it um, written in the past tense when it was clearly a future event from the time of Isaiah's writing. Well, what we have here in Isaiah 53, grammatically speaking, is the prophetic perfect tense. It describes future events that are so certain to happen that they are referred to in the past tense as if they had already happened. This is actually pretty common with Old Testament prophets. The assumption is that the prophet in a vision is carried to the time of the prophesied event and he's describing what he sees as an accomplished fact. Biblical Hebrew, you see, does not, does not use tenses in the same way as we do in English or Greek. Again, Isaiah wrote this chapter in the prophetic perfect. Thus, as he saw the actions of the verbs as whole or complete without respect to their timing. And prophecy is often presented in the perfect aspect because it's a direct revelation from God in which God, of course, being above and beyond time itself, the actions are not viewed in relation to time, but in relation to their certainty of accomplishment. We're told in Isaiah 53 how God promised a lamb, and, and today we'll see how that lamb was prepared. We'll examine from Luke 1, 26 through 38, how God accomplished what is humanly impossible through the birth of his one and only son. In verses 26 through 28, we see the place reserved for this preparation of God's lamb. We read that in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, her pregnancy is clear from the reference to her previously in verses 24 and 25, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, a descendant of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. The angel came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. And this, of course, points to her as a recipient of God's grace, not as is popularly held today by many, a bestower of God's grace. It's mistakenly implied that way in the Latin Vulgate, which reads, full, Mary, full of grace. But greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. This place reserved for this prayer. Uh, preparation was, first of all, a pure place. We're told, if you notice, that the angel came to a virgin. And this refers, of course, 
to a female that is sexually pure. In fact, if you notice in verses 27, the virginity of Mary is affirmed twice in that verse. And contrary to what some liberals might say, the word does not simply speak of a young woman, but of one who had never engaged in sexual relations. So you see, friends, the vessel God chose to use to bring his son into this world was a perfectly pure vessel. And this is important to realize because God promised that the Savior of humanity would be the seed or offspring of the woman. As we read earlier in Genesis 3.15, God said, I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. Speaking horse to the serpent. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. This simply means that God would send the Savior into the world through the body of a woman without the aid of human male. Why is that? Because all humans are sinners. And that sinfulness is passed on through the seed of the man. As we're told in Romans 5.12, So then, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all people, because all sinned. You see, friends, when Adam sinned in the garden, he became a sinner. And just as he passed on his human nature to his offspring, Adam also passed on his sinful nature to his children. They inherited his sin, and they too passed it on down the line. God's plan to send a Savior into the world involved him sending a pure Savior, one who would not inherit the sinful nature of humanity, but would still inherit a physical body and human nature. And God accomplished this through the virgin birth of Jesus. As Paul writes in Galatians 4.4, but when the appropriate time, or literally the fullness of time, had come, God sent out his son, born of a woman, born under the law. By sending Jesus into this world through the womb of a virgin, then God was able to give his son a human body and a human nature without his inheriting a fallen nature as well. And this enabled Jesus to be born without sin. <coughs> and to live without sin, and to die without sin. He was able to give his life as a pure, perfect sacrifice for fallen man. We're told in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we would become the righteousness of God. And Jesus was able then to satisfy God forever through the offering of his own body on the cross. We're told in the New Testament, 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, that he, Jesus Christ himself, is the propitiation or atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also for the whole world. And we certainly don't understand all the mechanics of how God sent his Savior into the world through the womb of a virgin. But we do know that the birth of Jesus is a foundational doctrine of our Christian faith. You see, friends, without a virgin birth, we have no Savior. Without a virgin birth, we have no hope. Without a virgin birth, we have no foundation upon which to build our house of faith. You see, to deny the virgin birth of Jesus is to deny Christ. Well, the place reserved for the Lamb's preparation was also a prophesied place. God promised to send his son into the world through a woman, as we read earlier in Genesis 3.15. And I will put hostility between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. And as the years passed, that prophecy was expanded by the prophet Isaiah. We read in Isaiah 7.14, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign, a confirming sign. See the virgin, which uh, is translated from the Hebrew word Alma, will conceive, have a son, and name him Emmanuel. Now, in the original context of Isaiah chapter 7, this passage in verse 14 pointed to a child then, in that day and age, who would be born during the time of Ahaz as proof that the military alliance of Syria and Israel against Judah 
would fail. That's what Isaiah was talking about there historically at that time. And within Isaiah's subsequent prophecies, this promise was ultimately applied to the future Davidic king who would one day rule over the nation. This verse from Isaiah, interestingly, is quoted in Matthew 1.23 directly in, in connection with Jesus' birth. Matthew uses the Greek word parthenos there, which clearly means virgin. Now, some liberal scholars have discounted Isaiah 7.14, and they have sought desperately but in vain for a loophole to reject the virgin birth. They claim since that Hebrew word Alma found in Isaiah 7.14 often means young woman, that it refers then primarily to a natural birth in Isaiah's only day or own day, and only secondarily to Christ. And yet, Matthew, which is a direct quote from Isaiah 7.14, clearly applies Isaiah's prophecy to the Virgin Mary. And there are two Hebrew words that are usually translated virgin in English. One is the word batula, which means virgin in the sense that we usually understand it. For example, it was used in Isaiah, Isaiah 62, verse 5, which speaks figuratively of Jerusalem's new relationship with God in the coming kingdom, comparing it to the happiness of marriage. It says, for as a young man marries a virgin, so your sons will marry you. And the second Hebrew word is Alma, the word that I said mentioned before is used in Isaiah 7:14, which can sometimes refer actually to a virgin, but it's often translated young woman. The context usually determines the correct usage. Now, the translators of the Septuagint, which is the term describing the Greek translation of the Old Testament, use the more specific Greek word parthenos, which means virgin, to translate Isaiah 7.14. And this is the Greek term that also appears, as I mentioned in the citation of Isaiah 7.14, in Matthew 1.23. So regardless of the meaning of the term in the Old Testament context, in the New Testament, Matthew's usage of the Greek term parthenos clearly indicates from his perspective that a virgin birth had taken place. And that the fact that the angel quotes this prophecy in Isaiah 7.14 to Joseph in Matthew 1.23 as an explanation for Mary's being with child before her marriage to him indicates that the prophecy referred to an unmarried woman who had a son by no physical contact with any man. That Greek word parthenos used in Matthew 23 then clearly means virgin. It's interesting that the same Greek word was used for the Parthenon, the Greek temple to the goddess Athena, which the Greeks of ancient days characterized as being a virgin. Well, in addition to the prophecy of Isaiah 7.14, Isaiah 9.6, familiar to most of us, says, For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Advisor. I'm using that word advisor, we use it as a counselor, but it really means kind of some extraordinary strategist because it refers to this king's ability to devise military strategy, as suggested in the context just a few verses earlier in verses 3 and 4. So he'll be named Wonderful Advisor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Now both of these verses tell us that God would move then in a miraculous manner to bring the promised Messiah into the world. Therefore, the virgin birth of Jesus really shouldn't surprise anyone. You see, friends, when God makes a promise, he's well able to make it happen. We're told in Romans 4.21 that he, referring to Abraham, was fully convinced that what God promised, he was able to do. When God makes a promise, he fully intends to bring it to pass. Many people need to realize that today, when we're thinking about Israel, God will restore his nation Israel, and Israel will turn to him during the coming tribulation period. The place reserved for the Lamb's preparation was also a prepared place. You know, to watch Mary as these verses unfold is to see a young woman who had, had been prepared for this moment. 
History tells us that every faithful Jewish girl was looking for the Messiah. And we're told that every Jewish girl actually hoped that she would be the chosen vessel through which God would send his Messiah into the world. And when the, Mary, when the angel appeared to Mary, she was amazed and startled. But she was prepared to respond to the will of the Lord in faith and faithfulness. Verse 38 of Luke 1 says, So Mary said, Yes, I am a servant of the Lord. Let this happen to me according to your word. And then the angel departed from her. It appears then that God, in his grace, had begun a work in her young heart long before this moment, so that when the moment actually arrived, Mary was ready and willing to do all that the Lord had desired of her. Just imagine the, the faith required for Mary to respond to the Lord as she did. You know, for a young, unmarried woman to become pregnant in that day was to be the focus of shame and disgrace and a possible death sentence, quite different than it is today. Uh, but Mary was willing to bear the shame and the burden of being the vessel through which God would send his son into the world. And we can thank God for people like Mary who are willing to do all the Lord requires, regardless of what it may require of them. You know, may the Lord find a heart like that beating within us. I, I trust that's our prayer. You know, nothing reveals our love for Christ like our unquestioning obedience to all that he requests of us. In John 14, Jesus said in verse 15 and 21, If you love me, you will obey my commandments. The person who has my commandments and obeys them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will reveal myself to him. Well, moving on verses 29 through 33, we see the promise revealed in this preparation. We read, But she, Mary, was greatly troubled by his, referring to the angels, words, and began to wonder about the meaning of this greeting. So the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Listen, you will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will never end. In verses 31 and 32 of this section, we see the promise of a special child. Mary was told that she would become the mother of a son, but this son would be no ordinary child. He would be her son, therefore he would indeed be human, but he would also be the son of the Most High. Meaning he would be a man, but he would also be God. And this was the prophecy of Isaiah 7.14 we read earlier. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a confirming sign. See, the virgin will conceive a son and name him Emmanuel. This was also the message of the angel to Joseph. That's recorded in Matthew 1.23. Look, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Well, this was the most profound moment for, of all time and eternity. This was the moment that God actually became flesh and walked among men. We're told in John 1, verses 1 and 14, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was fully God. Now the word became flesh and took up residence among us. We saw his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, full of grace and truth, who came from the Father. Later on in the New Testament, in Philippians 2, the Apostle Paul writes, beginning with verse 5, you should have the same attitude toward one another that Christ Jesus had, who, though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but he emptied, from the Greek verb ekanosin, he emptied himself by taking on the form of a slave, by looking like other men, and by sharing in human nature. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This, was, this then was the moment we could say that the Creator became dependent upon the creature. And when Jesus Christ was conceived in the womb of a virgin, 
the plan of the ages was moved out of eternity and into time. God himself robed himself, as it were, in human flesh, and he came into this world in order that he might die on a cross to, set his, to save his people from their sins. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Now Christ's emptying of himself, as I mentioned, is from the Hebrew, uh, I'm sorry, the Greek verb kenosis. It was the laying aside of the privileges of deity. Je Jesus did not lay aside any aspect of deity itself, but the privileges of deity. In heaven, the Son of God possessed infinite honor and glory, but he chose to leave that position of honor and he emptied himself, or made himself nothing, as we're told in Philippians 2, 7. When Jesus came to earth, he veiled his glory and chose to occupy the position of a slave. And his kenosis, then, was a self-renunciation, but not an emptying of deity. You see, Jesus never ceased to be God, and he did not exchange deity for humanity. What Jesus did set aside was his heavenly glory, he voluntarily refrained from using his deity then to make his life easier. You know, his miracles then were not done to benefit himself, but to help others. During his earthly ministry, Jesus completely submitted to the, himself to the will of the Father, as we're told in John 5.19. The late theologian John, Dr. John F. Walvoord, who served as president of Dallas Seminary for 34 years, he says in his book, Jesus Christ Our Lord, the act of kenosis may be properly understood to mean that Christ surrendered no attribute of deity, but that he did voluntarily restrict their independent use in keeping with his purpose of living among men and their limitations. Well, in verse 33, we have the promise of a saving child. It reads, listen, you will become pregnant and give birth to his son, and you will name him Jesus. Mary was told by the angel here that the child's name, again, was to be Jesus. And this name was actually a common name in that day. In the Hebrew tongue, it was the name Joshua. And many Jewish parents named their male children Joshua, or as the Greeks rendered it, Jesus. But of course, while the name might be common, the child to whom it was given was certainly not. The name Jesus himself means Jesus is salvation. And although Mary did not understand all that she was being told, she heard for the first time that name which is above every name. She didn't understand it then, but the child she would name Jesus would grow up and one day die on a cross to save lost sinners from their sins. He would be the only hope that sinners have. As Jesus replied to Thomas in verse 6 of John 14, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. His name would be the only name that would open the gates of heaven, redeem the human soul from the bondage of sin, deliver lost people from the threat of hell, and speak peace and hope to those who do not know God. You see, this child would be the fulfillment of a plan set in motion before the world was ever formed. We're told in Revelation 13, 8, and all those who live on the earth will worship the beast, everyone whose name has not been written since the foundation of the world in the book of life belonging to the Lamb who was killed. In 1 Peter 1, 20, he, Christ, was no, foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in these last times for your sake. He would die on a cross, rise from the dead, and ascend back into heaven to guarantee salvation for all who would trust him by faith. Thank God for the day God sent his son into the world to be the savior of God's people. In Matthew 1, 20 and 21, we're told that an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Moving on to verses 32 and 33, we see the promise of a sovereign child. 
Mary was also told that this special child, this saving child, would be a sovereign child. She was told that he would be a sovereign with a special pedigree, as it were. He would rule on the throne of David, thus fulfilling a prophecy given to David over a thousand years earlier in time. In 2 Samuel 7, we're told about this in verses 11 through 13, where we read that the prophet Nathan told King David, the Lord declares to you that he himself will build a house or a royal dynasty for you. When the time comes for you to die, I will raise up your descendant, one of your own sons, to succeed you, and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name, and I will make his dynasty permanent. In Psalm 132, verse 11, we're told that the Lord made a reliable promise to David. He will not go back on his word. He said, I will place one of your descendants on your throne. He would also rule over the house of Jacob, thus fulfilling the prophecy of Jacob made thousands of years earlier. Back in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, we read that the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, meaning from his descendants, until he comes to whom he belongs. The nations will obey him. Beyond that, he would also rule over, over a kingdom that would have no end. He would rule over his kingdom forever, thus fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah and others of the Old Testament prophets. As we're told in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, we, we, we uh, read it earlier, but I think it bears repeating. For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Advisor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. His dominion will be vast, and he will bring immeasurable prosperity. He will rule on David's throne and over David's kingdom, establishing it and strengthening it by promoting justice and fairness from this time forward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of heaven's armies will accomplish this. In these verses, which describe this promised child, we learn the wonderful truth that God would become a man, that he would die for sinners, and that he would rise again to rule forever. All the wonderful truth regarding the life, ministry, and death of Jesus that would be made plain later is revealed here in seed form. Now the question for you and me is this. Do I know him? Or do I just know about him? I know that you've all heard about Jesus, but have you ever believed in him for his promise of eternal life as a free gift? I trust that all of us assembled here this morning have, but you see this promise was made to Mary, but it's valid for anyone who will believe. In verses 34 through 38, we see the power released in this preparation. We read, Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I have not been intimate with a man? The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And look, your relative Elizabeth has also become pregnant with a, with a son in her old age. Although she was called barren, she is now in her sixth month. For nothing will be impossible with God. So Mary said, Yes, I am a servant of the Lord. Let this happen to me according to your word. And then the angel departed from her. Well, the power we released in this preparation is the power to conquer our doubts. Mary heard the words of the angel, but confessed that she did not understand how this could happen. Like all other Jews, she expected the Messiah to enter the world the old-fashioned, natural way. She wondered how she would be able to have a child since she had never been with a man physically. To Mary's mind, this was a dilemma that could not be surmounted. Well, thankfully, the angel had the answer. He told her that she was about to be part of the greatest miracle that the world had ever known. God was about to turn Mary into a miracle. The angel spoke the words that conquered Mary's doubts. The power released in this preparation is also the power to carry out God's desires. The angel addressed Mary's problem by giving her a promise in verse 35. He addressed, um, by giving her a promise, offering her some proof in verse 36, 
and by declaring God's power in verse 37. Mary was told that God was well able to do the things he had said he would do. The angel Gabriel declared the awesome power of God and the hope and comfort for Mary's heart was offered to her. You know, for many people, when they hear the Christmas message, there's a human tendency to doubt. They hear about God becoming flesh and being born in Bethlehem, and they, they have trouble with that. They hear that he came and died because he loves us and that he did it to save us from the fires of hell. And they say, what if that didn't mean me? Now, some, unfortunately, are brought up on a certain wing of Protestantism today are mistakenly taught that Christ died only for a certain group of people, so-called the elect, and that we cannot even know for certain if we're a part of that select group until we die. Well, Mary heard a message that was almost too fantastic to believe. When she confessed the fact that she did not see how it could be real, the angel offered her the promise of God, that God in his power was more than able to bring this to pass. If you've heard this message today and are plagued by fears and doubts regarding the message of Jesus, here's what you need to know. First of all, everything God said is true. Jesus is indeed his son. The Bible tells us in John 3, 16 and 17 that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Jesus came into this world to die for you. He died for you and rose from the dead. And he returned to heaven, and he's coming back to this earth someday soon. And all those who trust him by faith will be forever saved by his mighty power. And perhaps you're thinking, how can I know for sure? Well, in Mary's case, the angel told her about what God had done for her cousin Elizabeth. Mary immediately left to see, go see Elizabeth, and when she arrived, she found that Elizabeth herself was pregnant just like the angel had said later in verses 39 through 56 of Luke 1. Mary had proof positive that God had worked in the life of Elizabeth, and that gave her confidence to believe that he would work then in her own life as well. You know, for us, the proof that Jesus has the power to take a lost sinner and save them by his grace and change their life can be found by looking around this very room that we're here this morning in. All around us are lives that have been transformed by the grace of God. Look at what Jesus has done in the lives of those around us this morning. And know that what he's done for others, he'll certainly do for you. In John 6, 37, Jesus said, Everyone, everyone whom the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never send away. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for preparing your one and only Son, the Lamb of God, to enter the realm of humanity and to ultimately take away the sin of the world through his death and resurrection. Thank you, God, for demonstrating your love for us and accomplishing what was humanly impossible through the virgin birth of your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that he voluntarily submitted to your will and setting aside his heavenly glory to become like one of us, yet without sin, so that he was fully qualified to atone for the sins of the whole world. Help us, Lord, to seize the opportunities that you may grant us during this Christmas season to share this wonderful news with others who don't know you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.